Hi everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in and waiting for this event to go live. We are really happy to have you here. Uh, we also appreciate your patience and look forward to sharing this experience with you all. So to start, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land on which the Gupan Foundation Sydney now stands and where I am currently situated. I also wish to extend my respect and gratitude to their elders past, present and emerging. So uh, for those of you who are still trickling in to the live stream, thank you for joining us for our online catalogue and talk event today. This is in conversation with Toshiyuki Owada and Mark Frosty McNeil on the occasion of our current exhibition, Hiroshi Nagai Paintings for Music. My name is Simone Gorin and I'm with the Arts and Culture Department here at the Japan Foundation Sydney. The Japan Foundation Sydney is an Australian arm of the Japan Foundation, a non-profit cultural organisation which was established by the Japanese government to promote cultural and intellectual exchange between Japan and other nations. We run a diverse range of self-initiated programmes and events such as this one, including exhibitions, film festivals, grant programs, and uh, also Japanese language courses for all levels. In order to carry out our mission of bilateral exchange, we support an array of institutions and individuals, individuals including nonprofit organizations, universities, scholars, artists, and more. Usually our events are in person, but since this event is an online uh, program, we're encouraging dialogue in the comments section underneath the video. So you can let us know in the comments if you have any questions for our speakers and we'll make a note of those for the Q&A at the end of the talk. Just a quick note that we will also ask you to fill out a feedback form at the end, so please keep an eye out for that. Um, we'll also have it linked um, as a pinned comment in the, the top of the chat as well. So yeah, let's get started. A little bit about the exhibition, Paintings for Music. It's the first international solo exhibition of esteemed artist Hiroshi Nagai, offering a rare chance to see his works outside of Japan. It explores the relationship between Japan's city pop music and the artist's iconic landscape paintings. Since his debut in the late 1970s, Hiroshi Nagai has collaborated with musicians and brands around the world, leaving his mark on contemporary culture and style. His works have adorned record jackets for renowned musician, musicians such as Eiichi Otaki, who's a long vacation along with numerous other hits by Japanese musicians spearheaded the Japanese city pop music culture, which peaked in the 1980s. On display at our gallery are 20 original works by the artist spanning his career from the late 1970s until now. Uh, we've also learned a selection of record jackets from the artist's personal collection, all of which were made for a variety of music styles from Japan and also around the world, including city pop, soul, funk, pop, reggae, boogie, and lots more. The significance of this exhibition comes with the recent resurgence of city pop music throughout the West, which kicked off with an obscure 1980s Japanese pop song going viral on YouTube in 2017. Since then, the music genre and the guys associated illustrations have drawn a renewed widespread attention and found a new appreciation in contemporary culture. So if you're in Sydney or plan to visit us sometime soon, please drop by for a visit to see the exhibition, uh, which is on until January 23rd. Our talk event today coincides with the launch of the exhibition catalog, which can be viewed online via our website. The catalogue includes beautiful images of Nagai's work, uh, installation views of the exhibition, as well as three exceptional essay contributions from authors Toshiyuki Owada, Hirofumi Mizukawa, and Mark Frosty McNeil. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce two of these contributors and incredibly knowledgeable experts on City Pop. So our first guest is Toshiyuki Owada, a professor of American studies at Keio University, Tokyo, Japan. He is the author of On American Music, From Minstrel Show, Blues to Hip Hop, 
and was awarded the Suntory Prize for Social Sciences and Humanities in 2011. His research interests include Japanese and American popular music, Afro-Asia, and he also writes about literature and film on both sides of the Pacific. He has co-authored three books on hip hop and also a book on music in Haruki Murakami's works. Throughout 2020 to 2021, he is taking up a position of visiting scholar at Harvard Yenching Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts to conduct research on the resurgence of city pop in Asia and the West. Thank you for joining us today, Professor Awada. Our, so <laughs> Our next guest is uh, Mark Frosty McNeil. Mark is a DJ, radio producer, sonic curator, filmmaker, and creative community builder based in LA. He's the founder of DubLab, a pioneering web radio station that has been exploring wide spectrum music since 1999. His host, he hosts Celsius Drops, Drop, sorry, uh, a weekly DubLab radio show and has produced long running programs for Red Bull Radio, Marfa Public Radio and more. He co-curated and produced the Pacific Breeze compil compilations of city pop music for Light in the Attic Records, as well as Somewhere In Between. Ah, oh, sorry, I got it wrong. <laughs> Somewhere Between, a forthcoming album focused on the more experimental side of Japanese pop. His output on a multitude of international media platforms has focused on sharing transcendent, transcendent sonic experiences. Very cool. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Mark. All right, so feel free to take a look at both of their Twitter accounts as well. There's at A-D-A-W-H-O and at Dublab Frosty. So without further ado, I think we should just jump straight into it. Um, I'll hand over to the floor to you, Professor Awada. Oh, um, thank you so much for having me today. And I'm so happy to be um, in this event, uh, Nagai Hiroshi-san's exhibition in Sydney. And so happy to be with you, Mark, today. And so, um, yes, I, my name is Toshio Wada, and I teach American Studies at Keio University. And currently, um, I am in Cambridge, Massachusetts, as a visiting scholar at the Harvard Yanqing Institute. And I am conducting research on city pop. And I, I'm writing, I should be writing a book on a Yellow Magic Orchestra, which um, if you know um, something about city pop, you might know this group too. Um, Hosono Harumi was the member. He's like the center, central figure of the city pop re revival. And um, also Sakamoto Ryuichi, who may be the most famous Japanese composers alive, and also Takashi Yukihiro. And he's a, also a household name. Um, he was a drummer for the Sadistic Mika Band. And so, um, and also one of the things that I should be um, saying about City Pop is that um, I was in the music, I was in the same music circle as um, Takeuchi Maria and when I was in. Uh, when I was at a, as an undergrad, so at Keio University. And so as you may know, so Takeuchi Maria's Plastic Love, um, it was sort of like the anthem of the city pop revival. And so talking about those, so music circles, there are many music circles in Japanese universities. I think might be safely say that it's sort of like the clubs, maybe if you might have like an anime club in a university or college here. So it's sort of like this music circle where um, the students just join and um, do a lot of live performances and all that. And so, um, so when I got in, so Takeuchi Maria was already, she already graduated, but because she was already famous in the music scene, so um, many um, students, many freshmen came into um, our music circle because of, because they liked, um, Maria's music, or um, her partner, obviously, Yamashita Tatsuro. So um, if you belong to that um, circle, and, and if you played an instrument, and I play bass guitar, so there's like a big chance of you, you're playing 
um, one of those city pop songs like Plastic Love. And also Yamashita Tatsuro's Sparkle was also our favorite. And um, the songs of Yoshida Minako and Onoki Taiko, which are included in the compilation album um, Pacific Breeze, which uh, Mark had compiled. So <clears throat> I don't think we really um, used the word city pop at that time. We, we, more, we used more like a new music was a popular name of the category in those days. But um, we sort of played the numbers, the tunes of Takeuchi Mario and Masha Tatsuro and all that while I was in college. So um, the essay that I contributed to this catalog, so I, I try to see how this word city pop had started to pop up in like mainstream media. And um, if you could see, so there's firstly, there's a term like city music coming, appearing in the 1970s. And so it coincided, coincided with the, um, with the era, the, like the change of attitudes, especially among the younger generation. Because um, if you remember, there's a fairly big um, student movement going on in the late 60s in Japan. You still have the Sama Sanso incident with the Red Army in 1972. And so those students, the younger, younger guy, younger generation, were mostly anti-US. But in the mid 1970s, there is sort of like a shift um, in those younger generation with the more like an intimate feeling toward the America. And um, so the city, this, this term city implies itself like a change of attitude. It, it's also um, obviously it, it coincides with the rise of the consumer cultures. And so city music has become um, city pop, I think in the early eighties. I think the first use of city pop I've found so far is in the late 1970, 1978 or 1979, but it seems sort of like an exception. But um, first it was used with city music, city pop. They were used with like um, musicians of like Michael Franks, um, George Benson, and later uh, with like Boz Skaggs. So basically this um, term city pop and city music was linked, connected with the um, scenes of the West Coast. So city pop, so it, it's named city pop, but it's not like necessarily like the skyscrapers of New York or maybe London. It's, it's specifically, if you're talking about the US influence, is the West Coast. And <clears throat> so yes, um, so yeah, that's, about that's sort of what I talked about in the essay, and um, so I'll pass it down to Mark now. Thank you so much, Awada san. I encourage everybody to check out his incredible essay as part of the online catalog for the uh, Hiroshi Nagai exhibition, and I want to uh, thank. First off, I uh, thank the Japan Foundation Sydney for having me. I'm really honored to uh, both have contributed an essay, but also to be here sharing some of my thoughts. I come to this as somebody who's constantly learning every step of the way. I'm, I'm really uh, somebody who embraces kind of amateurism to not fully understand is actually an asset and it's really wonderful because you're able to continue the journey and continue learning every step of the way and as a DJ and a sonic explorer a lot of my learning is done through records and it's done through traveling especially while traveling the world and and digging in bins and, and seeing these kind of cultural artifacts that really represent, you know, the soul of the people, food and music, you know, are those kind of direct nodes into, uh, into the soul. And so I've had the good fortune uh, through Dublab, the radio station that I co-founded to have visited Japan many times over the years. And each time I always want to go record shopping. And so, on one of these mini visits and record shopping 
trips, I started digging into, I really like finding things in the domestic bins and the, the, the homespun, homegrown kind of music spaces because often what happens, and this happens frequently with, with most cultures, people are looking outside of themselves. They're looking across the ocean. They're looking, you know, the grass is greener sort of syndrome. And so people are often kind of projecting outside of their own space. And part of that is fulfilling this kind of human desire for fantasy and creating a world through sound is really powerful and through images as well. So digging in the, the bins in Japan, I started coming through across records like this, you know, uh, Tatsuro Yamashita's For You, Suzuki, and this just kind of pops out of the bin. And I was wondering, you know, it was so cheap at the time. It was, uh, you know, I don't know how many yen, but, but not much, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe a thousand yen or something. Or coming across albums like this that, that start sparking my imagination and seeing notes about, you know, Jamaica and, and this incredible Niagara record that is just kind of speaking to another world, you know, this kind of 1950s prototypical American couple sitting and watching this kind of fantasy TV, but with bamboo in the background. And so you're getting these kind of evocative worlds that I didn't fully understand. And for me, not understanding is the, the first step. And that's something the trail that I want to follow. So I started following that trail and on the first needle drops, I started to kind of hear a different sort of sound, but at the same time, a very familiar sound. And a lot of the city pop DNA is, you know, Japanese lyrics, but built on kind of an American beat, built on an American heart through sound. And so I was hearing this reflection of not only America in music, but very specifically Los Angeles in music. And being somebody who's lived in Los Angeles for a long time, not a native to Los Angeles, but I've lived here for 26 years. I started to hear these reflections of my own city come back at me through sound, but also through the visuals presented. And that really intrigued me and pulled me into it. So for me, one of the most interesting things about city pop are these kind of coded signals, mixed signals, and a lot of it is the imagination and the projection of uh, uh, a new ideal. And so that's the thing that continues to pull me into this music not being a native Japanese speaker, not being a Japanese speaker at all, there's also a lot of uh, uh, maybe misunderstanding or, or, or a desire to understand more. And so to hear the music, but then to be able to start to decode the lyrics little by little by little is really important. And people like Owada-san uh, uh, do great service to be able to share their knowledge so that myself and others can uh, dig into it. So it's a pleasure to, uh, to work on this puzzle and to be here and to talk about the puzzle. I'm really thrilled to be able to engage in conversation with Awada-san here. So thanks for having me. <clears throat> so I might just, so yeah, um, I'm so uh, glad to have um, a chance to talk to you this way. Um, so one of the things that I really want to ask you was um, how this, like the resurgence of city pop has sort of started around you. I mean, the community that you really commit in. So like Simone just um, told us that there was a song, I think it was the Plastic Love, Takeuchi Maria 2017, sort of um, um, had this like so many million views. And then, but then if, if you look, um, a little further back, you have um, like Mac DeMarco, the singer-songwriter, Canadian singer-songwriter, doing like an homage to Hosono-san, I think back in 2012. Yeah. And also um, the Edge Mota, the Brazilian musician, he compiled this mixtape AOR, which included um, Yamashita Tatsuro and um, Matsushita Makoto and um, I think that was in 2014. But um, so your essay starts with, um, I think it was 2002 or three. Yeah. And you just talked about the, the Tatsuro sans for you was still cheap, right? It's so expensive right now, I can't get it anywhere. But so, yes, I, I really remember those days where 
those records were not so expensive. And so how, how did it sort of like evolve and um, come the, around you that those city pop, Japanese city pop has become sort of like a thing around you? I think that it's interesting that you mentioned people like Mac DeMarco or Ed Mocha. I think that there's this sort of uh, culture, DJ culture and sort of a shared, uh, when something's in the air, as they say, mm -hmm. and, and these things start bouncing around often in these kind of more underground circles, DJ circles, DJ nights, you know, mixtapes, radio shows on kind of underground radio, or internet radio. And so there's a lot of shared ideas. When, when Brazilian music of the 60s and 70s, Tropicalia, was hitting, it started seeping up from those kind of DJ communities and DJ circles, as well as things like Afrobeat and a lot of the kind of renewed interests and a lot of kind of international genres or, you know, subgenres, micro genres from anywhere in the world. This often starts with the underground. And for me, that's really important because you get these early whispers of kind of a new sound and a new scene. And often that is also coinciding with its being out of vogue with the general public. And so that's why when traveling the world or even here in Los Angeles, I'm always interested in looking at the bins, the record bins underneath the main ones, you know, try to find try to find the record bin tucked so far into the corner of the store that you could mistake it for like an umbrella box or something. You know, you want to find the things that people are not looking at because those are where the treasures lie. And I'm not thinking of it as far as like, you know, excavating for, for myself, but trying to find things that have stories that aren't being told at the current moment. And traveling in Japan, there are oftentimes both with the city pop records and i didn't know what city pop was and people probably weren't even talking about city pop really at that point um, but also even earlier with group sounds and you know kind of the the guitar driven groups i was uh going to record stores and people were practically giving away the records you know passing the records saying you know we're not into we're not into it take them or you know give me you know give me 100 yen for it, 300 yen for it. And so those sort of worlds are what interest me. And so for me, it was kind of picking up records, piling them up, but I didn't at the moment really give it much thought. And it wasn't until later that I started, I found a Tatsuro Yamashita record right around the corner from my house at a record store. And hearing that record was the, it kind of made me want to re-explore these records that I had bought in Japan previously and didn't quite give enough time to. But I think that Mac DeMarco and different people, there's, there were almost just on a pure sonic level, there's certain sounds, you know, that, that come in. If you turn on the radio and you close your eyes and you can say, well, in general, if you know music, you're a musicologist, that's from the 80s or that's from the 90s, that's a 2000 song. You start to hear the kind of sonic imprint of an era and there's new genres that start to you know, mimic sonic imprints or create their own fusions. And I think that City Pop matched really well with kind of a sound that was happening anyway. I think that people like Ariel Pink and various kind of artists were into almost this soft rock AOR sort of sound and that was mirrored in what was happening with City Pop. Yeah, <clears throat> right. And um, so how, yes, so this is, I think, the biggest question that people are always asking, especially in Japan, is that what is, what about the City Pop is that not just the Western, it's, it's, it's big in Asian countries as well, but what about those city pop sounds that seem to resonate right now? I mean, this is really, so going back to the, the conversation that the For You was not such an expressive LP, maybe in the early 2000s. So when I was in college, undergrad, so like Yamashita Tatsuro, Takeshi Maru, they were extremely popular. Yeah. But um, like the music enthusiasts, I would say, they were more like into like post-rock 
or new wave. And so maybe some um, music fans might thought that Gage and Maria was like too popular yeah. for um, like those um, music nerds or enthusiasts would dig into. But then, um, as you say, there is a sort of like a movement not necessarily related to city pop, but there's a sense of like the, the turn to the 80s. I mean, if, if we're talking about the 80s sound, I think it just peaked this year with like weekends, blinding lights and all that. But um, maybe like Thundercat, the artist like Thundercat is trying to revitalize maybe um, Kenny Loggins and yeah. those artists. And I saw, I'm so, somehow I sort of feel the parallel there of the sound, but how would you describe, what is it that is really appealing to the audience in the world about city pop? I think that what's interesting is that, and I can see how these things might not quite square, that if you were, you know, uh, of a certain age in Japan, you might, you know, again, put this music to the side and think it was, you know, some of it was popular at the moment. It's something that has come and gone. But there's also this kind of DJ knack for finding other cuts in a record. Um, and I think that Plastic Love, for instance, wasn't necessarily, you know, wasn't this big hit. It wasn't, you know, something that was heard around the world. And much of this music wasn't. It was music that was made seeking a specific sound, often a West Coast kind of American sound, but enabled by these kind of incredibly sophisticated synthesizers. So you're having somebody aiming for kind of a certain sound, you know, this, these tight spun funk grooves and things that already have kind of an earworm nature to them, but also creating them and manifesting them through these really kind of new synthesizers that already were setting it sonically into the future in a way, but creating these kind of very, you know, unique things, but with Japanese lyrics, because it was really meant for a domestic audience. And so I think that listeners outside of Japan, again, it's this sort of idea of kind of looking beyond your home turf for something new. And I think that DJs specifically really start to do that early groundwork. They start to kind of scout and find these things. And they're also finding maybe it's one cut on an album of 12 songs, you know, the, tw the 11 of the 12 songs, the DJ might not be caught dead playing, but it's that 12th one that is sort of, uh, you know, uh, anomaly for the record that might be, you know, a, a, a soft rock artist doing a disco cut or something. And that's the one that they start to kind of play and that starts to kind of bring, you know, new interest. So I think that part of the idea of the, the DJs, and journalists and other people who are kind of like writing that early edge, they're, they're there to start to kind of like contextualize, recontextualize, or just contextualize for the first time, almost creating something out of thin air that didn't exist. As far as city pop, there was, there was some groundwork already there. There was this idea and there was, there was talk about it. But I think that it's almost, it's crystallizing more now than it ever had before but it's going through the filter of modern ears and it's going through the filter of ears that have the internet, you know, ears that are able to on, you know, one click here, Thundercats then changes and on the next click, you know, here, Hulumi Hosono, you know? And so I think that we have this access to a wide world of music right now, which is a bit dizzying, but, it also reflects sort of what was happening with the idea of city pop, kind of constructing something out of thin air in a way, constructing a, a dream that could live on a record. You, you use this incredible, I, I, in your essay for the online catalog, you talk about uh, weightlessness. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's this idea of kind of weightlessness and this idea of, of fantasy and being between worlds is really important for, for this. And the Pacific Breeze albums that, that we created, I'm not gonna hold this up like a TV show plug, but I'm gonna hold it up so you can actually just see it. But it's this idea of kind of between worlds. And if you see, you know, this kind of tree that very much, you know, you immediately think of Japan when you see this sort of pine tree. 
And here on this side, you see these palm trees, which you really immediately think of uh, California, Los Angeles, and this pool in the middle, which could be sort of this, this world between, this sort of limbo world. And I think that city pop is sort of often hanging in this limbo world where it's, it's not quite Japanese and it's not quite American. It's somewhere that's, that's caught in between, but in a really lovely way where it was sort of this uh, new potential and it was the sound of people dreaming. I, I love, there was this, uh, this story that um, uh, was, I'll, I'll probably get it wrong here, but it was, uh, I'm talking about uh, uh, Eichi Otaki's uh, album, A Long Vacation, and it's the, uh, the song Canary Island Nights. Um, and uh, there was uh, this idea of like, the Canary Islands. It's uh, Takashi Matsumoto was talking about Canary Island nights and he's thinking of the Canary Islands and thinking of Hawaii and thinking of this sort of specific landscape. But then when he actually went to the Canary Islands, it was totally different. So I think that sometimes our ideals and our dreams don't quite square with the reality, but that doesn't take any credit away from the dreams, you know, the dreams create new things. I, I'd love to hear more about your idea of kind of, of weightlessness and this idea of like, why is weightlessness important in both Nagai's work, but also in this music? What is the power of weightlessness? Yeah, actually, um, this word weightlessness, weightlessness um, I didn't make it up, but it was this word the coming out from this editor in the 1970s who launched this um, magazine called the Popeye. It's a really popular yeah. magazine. And it's the, the title is Popeye, the magazine for city boys. So you have this yeah. city. And so this, this editor is um, reflecting what he was doing in the 1970s. And so she was, in this book, she talks about um, how he managed to make the younger generation like the US because you know to, until like the late 60s um, and the early 70s many students who were in the student movement they were anti-US so um, in the 19 mid 1970s he um, I think he stayed in Los Angeles for like one month or two months to to establish to launch this magazine and then he he introduced all those new sports um, hang gliding, surfing, and um, jogging, and um, and so this skateboarding, yeah, skateboarding, hang gliding, and surfing. So he sort of connected this new concept of city with those sports, and th these sports somehow has to do with the sense of weightlessness and the sense of like equilibrium, and. Um, when I read that um, quote, um, I just automatically thought about Nagai-san's illustration, which was which really seems to fit the idea of the, yes, uh, as you talk about the weightlessness, sort of like an abstract, the fantasy of the West Coast. So it's not, yeah, it's not the real Canary Islands, yeah. but it is a fantasy. So, so, so I think I, I read somewhere that Nagai-san he started to um, draw under the influence of surrealists. Mm -hmm. And then he was, uh, he went to West Coast and he was really um, had a big impact there. And also there was the super realism of how uh, the, the, the movement in the arts where you sort of really copy the photographs. So those things sort of come to uh, Nagai-san's work to form this really sense of, yeah, fantasy and um, sort of like a three centimeters above the ground, right? It's, yeah. it's like a fantasy. And um, yeah, so that sense and the city pop or the city music that was really starting to get on in Japan really fit together to construct a fantastic um, image of the West Coast, I guess. Yeah, and it's, it's, you know, it's funny because this idea of, you know, I, 
I, I can't tell you the last time I either surfed, skated, I've never gone hang gliding. You know, I've done all <laughs> these things that, that you think about a space and you think about what people are doing and people are doing that. But it's also, you know, there's so, so many dynamic aspects to Los Angeles and also to Tokyo. And I think that kind of living in that world of, of sort of a, a lovely misunderstanding in a way or, or, or trying to understand or, or dreaming mixed with good intentions, you know, I think that we're, we're like Velcro as we move through these, this life, you know, we're picking up all of these different things and the guy, you know, you, you get the Magritte sort of floatiness in his work and you also, you know, get the, the, super, you know, hyper realist or, you know, advertising, you know, meets pop art sort of thing. And all of these things, you know, become holy Hiroshi and a guy, you know, it's nobody else, but it's his experiences that he pulls together. And the city pop artists who wouldn't probably be caught dead saying, I am a city pop artist. Most artists, you know, who are worth their salts, you know, try to dodge genres and genres are meant for you know, people like us who are trying to figure things out, you know, and trying to, trying to classify. But I think that there's also something to say. I, in the first Pacific Breeze record, I, I talked about blurry boundaries, kind of drawing a genre with blurry, intentionally blurry boundaries, because you want it to be porous. You don't want it to be, you know, this static thing to say you're in or you're out. People might be teetering on the edge. And I think that the artists who are involved in, in city pop, they were traveling to Los Angeles. You know, there's famously, you're hearing of Horumi Hosono and Happy End coming to seek that Burbank sound, you know, which I don't think people here in, in Los Angeles were even talking about Burbank for one or even talking about the Burbank sound, but they were seeking Little Feet and Van Dyke Parks and they, they knew what they wanted sonically or artists coming to work with Stevie Wonder, or Herbie Hancock, and you're having a lot of the artists being informed by real world interactions here, uh, real world collaborations, but they're also taking everything from their life in Japan or anywhere else that they've lived in the world. And even Japan from Hokkaido to Okinawa is so different, you know, and you've got microclimates and cultures and things that are so different from Kansai to, you know, to being in the heart of Tokyo, they're worlds apart, but everybody's bringing this and creating their own kind of amalgam, their fusion. And I think that, you know, the idea of also jazz fusion and the soft rock and sort of, artists want to create new worlds. They want to shift and they want to sculpt kind of new worlds and sound. And I love this idea of both being weightless, but also being weighted by your experience, you know, and being informed by your experience. And, and so, you know, I have no answers really, but I sure enjoy the journey towards the, the trying to figure out the question. And I think that, you know, you're, you're somebody who's so um, experienced in, in music and Japanese culture, as well as beyond, you know, in different genres around the world. But, you know, we have these exchanges and we're trying to figure it out as we go along, you know, we're, there's no clear answers, but that's what makes it enticing and exciting to, to kind of hear. Was there anything that you heard kind of circle around for you as a song that you, you know, just felt like, wow, like I, I remember this song, but I can't believe that it's back, you know, or, or, or even a copy of a song, you know, that you heard as the future funk song or Vaporwave come back. So yeah, when the compilation came out, the Pacific Breeze. There you go, you're doing, now you're doing the TV show thing. We're both doing it, perfect. <laughs> so, what I was really surprised about was that it, it really relates to your point about um, the blurring boundaries and uh, maybe the, like the reality and the fantasy. So what um, you have on the one hand, you have um, like a, a song that was played by those you know, the, the virtuoso sessions, studio musicians, really tight and um, like um, well, Yoshida Minako's Midnight Driver, maybe. Yeah. But then you also put together um, 
you were talking about, you know, the, the, the sophisticated West Coast sound, and also there's the synthesizer always coming in. So you also put um, Hosono-san's um, the, the Sportsman, which is um, almost like an electronic music. Yeah. And this was a really surprise. And it was a surprise, but it totally made sense to me, mm. which is, so it was, so, so you put up for you, Yamashita Tatsuro, I think that was, that came in 1982. And that was just the year when um, Lindrums and the Roland 808, the rhythm machine came out, but then those really good studio musicians, session musicians were still on play. Yeah. And so you have like those really impeccable beats made by those session musicians. And also you have this like a pre precision, precise yeah. beat going on by the synthesizers. And, and you, you, the way you, you put both of those songs in one compilation is really amazing. And um, how it, it, it's, you know, so it's, it's blurring the boundaries. You have the electronic beat and the human beat. And this is something that sort of blurs between the human and the machine, maybe. Mm. I think that, I mean, you know, Hosono and that sort of world of these such expert musicians, studio musicians, um, but also searching for new sounds constantly. Um, and these instruments, I think that, you know, the honoring of the instrument, I, I, I can't remember if it was Phil Harmony or, or one Hosono album that, that where the, the instruments were credited as performers. And I think that there's this idea of, you know, these kind of instruments having such a life and a sound to themselves. But if you have both the incredible musician programming these new innovative you know, instruments, but also trying to flip it and twist it and try to use it in the wrong way, I think that's usually when a lot of the best ideas come up, happy accidents. And you know, I think that even the person who is kind of laying the best laid plans and is so expert you know, to, to be free and loose, I think that Happy End and Hosono they were so good and are so good, you know, what they, they do that you have to be that good in order to then be that open and loose, you know? And I think that Hosono has very much kind of a West Coast mindset in a way where it's a really open headspace. And I think that the idea of there's, there's no rules, you know, it's all about projecting into the future and projecting somewhere else. So I think that, for me, sonically, these things really coexist. You have the same sort of spirit, different instruments, you know, and I think that uh, what Hosono is doing can live, coexist side by side with, you know, with uh, Midnight Driver and uh, uh, Minako Yoshida's work. But I think these are all peers and these are conversations and they're people who are just kind of aiming to create new worlds and sound and, you know, whether the, there's a drum machine one day you know, the next day there might be a drummer and a drum machine. The next day there might be three drummers. There might be five drum machines. So I think it's just kind of a palette, you know, and using the tools. But I think that the intention is really what's there. Um, but yeah, it's fun to put all this stuff together and to share these things. I think that should we should we um, open up to folks and and ask you know if there's any questions and we could also play some jams if you like. Um, but there's Simone. I am back. <laughs> but I could talk to I could talk to Awada san for, for years. So I don't know how long this Zoom uh, uh, meeting uh, is scheduled for, but we could do it for we could do it for years. Well, yeah, it's I mean, I would love for you to do that. <laughs> it's so great. Well, to both hear. our children, our children might not be as happy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. They might be running you. <laughs> um, well, yeah, thank I mean, thank you so much for what you've discussed so far. It's honestly been really enlightening and like, I feel like obviously I've read both of your essays of course um, in the catalogue but I feel like I've learned I've we've gone a bit deeper into both of your backgrounds with City Pop um, and like uh, Professor Owada it's really fascinating to hear that you are actually part of that 
in a circle of musicians, um, I guess. So um, while we're waiting for some more questions to come through, I just want to ask a quick question in relation to that, um, because I am really interested to know more about your personal relationship with City Pop in that sense. Um, so yeah, like what, what was the, the genre something that you, you know, you grew up with and you were making um, with these musicians like Maria Takeuchi, um, or is it something? Is it something that you've more come to appreciate now, later, with the resurgence and with your research, or has it always been like an ongoing kind of fascination and interest for you? So, um, yes, actually, I'm trained as an Americanist, American studied scholar. So, I've been doing a lot in um, basically American popular music. But um, since I think I would say this may be five or six years, I started to more focus on the Japan US um, musical exchange, cultural exchange. And actually, I, I didn't know about the city pop resurgence um, until after that. But I, as um, so, I was really into playing music when I was in college. I, I stayed in university maybe too long <laughs> just playing music. So I, I was thinking about how those 1970s music was influenced by American music. But then this, this, this resurgence of city pop um, was, came about. So I was really surprised to see those um, compilations, Pacific Breeze, and I think Light in the Attic had um, a folk music compilation in Japan just before that. So I was um, really interested in how the people outside of Japan was listening to those music that I was always familiar with. And um, Yes, so um, this is the, the, the music circle that, that I belong to was really sort of um, everybody knew that, that um, Takeuchi Maria was a graduate of this circle. And um, yeah, so I, I got to, this is sort of like a side story. I got to work with um, Tatsuro Yamashita one time at a feature in a magazine and I had a chance to have dinner with him. And so going back to the conversation with Mark, so one of the things that really sticks to me that he said was that um, the, the musicians, the Japanese musicians, the, 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 especially the rhythm section of the Japanese musicians in the late 1970s, they are the ones that are world class. And that's what he said. And that was because, you know, as a, like an amateur musician, we go to studio and you sort of play those American music, but we also feel that we cannot have this like a specific groove that those music, American musicians are doing. But according to the Mashita-san, Tatsuro-san, he says that the rhythm section, the Japanese rhythm section is actually the world class. And that sort of makes me th rethink about is the, the city pop and those electronic music that was going on at the same period of time. And those how um, this specific groove appeal to not just the Japanese audience, but it's starting to um, just go around the world. And so that really surprises me. And um, it's, it's, it's a really, great things to think about too. I mean, that's sort of the instrumental aspect, you know, is the universal, the sound, you know, is universal. And I think that when people, even I think it happened historically within Japanese kind of uh, music circles, the hangups of, you know, singing in, in, for there for a while in Japanese, you know, in the kind of new rock, like how do you sound cool and sound rock if you're singing in Japanese? And then it took Hosono and crew to come along and to do it in a new way, to reformulate what was happening lyrically and cadence-wise and flip it up. But I think that 
you know, sonically, I think that the sound is so universal. And I think that when you're hearing these kind of, you know, incredibly tight grooves by incredible musicians in the best studios, but also, you know, the, the economic, not only stability, but just, you know, incredible dream state that was happening in Japan at the time allowed for time and time's really important, you know, and, and there's a uh, Hosono, you know, famously has living dining kitchen studio that was built for him because uh, Kuni Mirai from Alpha was like, you're in the studio all the time. We have to get other artists in there. I'm going to build you your own studio. And literally he said it was living dining kitchen. He would go over, open the door and Hosono would be there sleeping, you know? And so it's this idea of just, you know, a space to create, a space to create. And I think that that time, space and place in Japan allowed for this music to come to life, you know, and it was incredible, it is incredible music. The famous Alpha Studio, that's yeah. so good, that song, yeah. So much magic created there, but also you have to make space for more magic. So he built him a new space. Um, I've got a question um, from Susan, actually, and that's come through. So the question is, can you talk about the decision to, oh, so this is for Mark, I should say. <laughs> um, can you talk about the decision to commission works by Hiroshi Nagai for both of the Pacific Breeze album covers? I mean, he, in a way, just, it made sense. You know, when you talk about, you look at the work and it, it's between worlds, you know, it's, it has this, again, this idea of weightlessness, but also, you know, these kind of, uh, you, you can't quite tell where you are. And in the second one, you know, this, you see the city in the background, but you see very much, you feel like it's Los Angeles, feels like actually specifically like the Culver City neighborhood or Century, Century City neighborhood of Los Angeles. Um, but, or it could be Hollywood, but it feels like Los Angeles, but it could also be anywhere. It's blurry and it's not quite in focus, but it's evocative. And I think that, for us, it was that idea of coming to the table and saying, we're putting this together with the best intentions and putting these sounds, kind of knitting sounds together that, that feel like they have a kinship, um, even if it's us kind of stretching and reaching and trying to pull these things together that, that might not otherwise be put in the same bag, but putting this work together and, uh, and, and kind of letting it be blurry at the same time, you know? So I think that his work really had, it just hit that, that note for us. Um, and I should say, I'll let you know, we're working at number three right now. This is the first time that anybody's heard about that. Hmm. So, um, so, so you can look forward to some more uh, Hiroshi Nagai, um, Pacific Breeze Beauty. He might not even know about it, so. <laughs> you know. So, but um <laughs> but it'll continue and so it'll be interesting but for volume one it was really we thought about you know sonically it almost was these kind of light bright airy daytime tunes and so we we this painting really kind of spoke to that and for the second volume you know with songs like tokyo taste and these different songs kind of felt a little like darker night time you know vibe and so we specifically were kind of creating that world um i don't know if uh mid afternoon is going to have the same i don't know what our theme will be this time but we're gonna we're gonna figure it out um yeah <laughs> that's but it'll be exciting. fun too yeah his works you know so so incredible but there there are other artists you know um who are who are you know we're really doing work that, that was part of that genre um you know and made a lot of sense i mentioned Aizen suzuki or peter sato or you know there's so many artists um and i think now you know people like i i such a fan of shintaro sakamoto's work who both is kind of creating sound that is sort of like pulling from the dna of city pop or you know again he probably wouldn't call it that either but a specific era in Japan and then creating his own visual universe around that. And uh, it's, it's really phenomenal. Great. Um, so we have another question that um, we can, is a good springboard for that um, last one, maybe for Professor Owada. 
Uh, Ari asks, can you please tell us some of your favorite City Pop album covers? Album covers? Yeah. Well, I mean, the Otake, Otake songs, Long Vacation is all time favorite, obviously. And uh, this is really, uh, I really like um, that's also on for you. Just um, I like the cover. I like the music there, and the the, the album that just Mark put it up. So actually, these are my two albums that I like. And maybe Matsushita Makoto's Night Flight. They have a really such an impeccable groove that album. <laughs> um, yes. Great. What about you, Mark? <laughs> I mean, I also love For You. I think that that's such a, a beautiful album cover. And as Awada Sa mentioned, A Long Vacation, you know, kind of hits that spot as well. Um, I like the whole, the, the CB, Sony CBS uh, sound, the, the series with Pacific and AGNC and all of these sort of library music, the sound picture series, I think it's called. Um, that a lot of the YMO uh, crew and various kind of studio musicians were a part of, but they were creating these worlds, you know, AGNC album and Pacific album. And it was, it felt like, you know, very much a library record, this kind of record that was mood music, but really hitting that mood. And usually there was a photograph that accompanied that. And to be honest, some of the best city pop are also portraits, you know, they're like the, the uh, Moon Glow by Tatsuru Yamashita, that was this record I picked up on my home turf. It was really influential to me. And I wouldn't say it's a great cover, but it's very much a specific vibe. And you get that, you know, city vibe, that cosmopolitan kind of cool vibe of the moment of the era in Japan, just kind of popping out of the cover. So I think I wouldn't put certain covers on my wall, you know, as art pieces, Hiroshi and the guys were very much art pieces, um, but the, there were a lot of great records that had just really interesting photos that felt of the moment and, and encapsulate that that sound and that that scene. I'm talking about those um, scenes. I think the 1970s when Hosono-san moved from Tokyo to um, she moved to this place called Sayama in Saitama, which was and he lived in this. Um, ex um, military houses where they sort of made like a commune of artists and not just musicians Kosaka Chu was there and Hosono san was there and also those designers those young designers they were all living in one place and so they had this like a um, same um, attitude and they were a little bit away from Tokyo they could do themselves so that DIY um, spirit that was in that period of time, yes, as you say, the time, the place is really important. So that the Sayama and all those uh, community-like places with musicians and designers, that was that must be really crucial of yeah. those, um, making the whole culture there. Making a culture, but also tuning into, I know they were talking about the Far East Network, you know, part of the Armed Forces Radio Network from the US. And so you're creating a culture that's very specific to a space, but is also, like all culture, open to the outside world, whether it be radio airwaves or magazines coming in, kind of import culture or trips abroad, like Hiroshi Nagai, you know, spending these early 70 summers in the US and being imprinted. So I like the idea of you make it your own, it's truly your own. It's, you know, it's this culture that is very specific and kind of homespun, but also open to the influence of the world. And I think that my hope as people hear this, this music, you know, recontextualized and newly shared with the world, that they're bringing it into their world and, and might create new genres down the road. You know, we're hearing some being created now, but, I want to hear what somebody creates, you know, from vaporwave, you know, mixed with something totally different. You know, you might have an avant-garde classical mixed with vaporwave and be a new thing that comes out of, you know, Madagascar in the year 2050 or something. And that that's exciting to me. You know, sound is universal and it it's uh, it should be experimented with and flipped and turned and turned. Um, we actually received. 
uh, a comment from one of the uh, Pacific Breeze producers, um, uh, Yososuke Kitazawa. So I just want to read it out. Um, <laughs> so he says, hi there, I'm one of the producers of Pacific Breeze. I'd like to add that for Pacific Breeze Volume 1, we wanted Hiroshi to add some elements that were specifically Japanese, which you don't see much in Hiroshi's works. That's why you see the pine trees and an island in the distance. That's supposed to be like Enoshima. So just some background information for you there on that uh, Hiroshima guy painting. That's I think like having that insider context is really interesting because I think people who don't necessarily or aren't familiar with Hiroshima guy's paintings wouldn't necessarily realize that he's cutting and pasting a little bit from these like different spaces and these different worlds. And um, it's kind of like an imaginary realm that he's creating, like almost like a point of escapism, which I think lends to the music as well, that idea of weightlessness that you were discussing earlier. Um, I have, <laughs> oh, sorry, go on. I, I was just, I had a question for you, you know, being, spending now so much time kind of immersed in the work and seeing the work as you're moving through the exhibition at Japan Foundation Sydney, you know, his, his work is often tied to music, but it's also disconnected from that as well. But moving through the space, are his paintings to you and his work very just musical? Does it, does it exude music or can it fully live separately from that? I, I think his paintings can live separately. Like I think that's, for example, if you viewed his work not knowing about his affiliation yeah. with at all, um, you just saw the works. Definitely, they're, they're beautiful, um, like hyperreal um, paintings that are, are very carefully constructed and really do, like they do, you can fit them into a, like a wider art context. Um, but the nice thing about Hiroshi Nagai's work um, and his practice, I guess, is that he, he isn't, doesn't have to be categorized into one thing. You know, he's an illustrator, he's a musician, he's an artist, he's a designer. Um, he kind of exists without these, these sort of weighty labels. And so when you see the paintings, um, you can appreciate them uh, for what they are, but I think um having the music alongside it uh and knowing about that and hearing the music with it it just gives it so much more depth and there's so many more layers to unpack as to why he well, why he's painting in this style and why the musicians of this music and other types of music want his paintings to correlate with their message um so that's been really in interesting to see the paintings up close um, in real life. It's extremely different to, my first experience was maybe, you know, over six years ago now when I was living in Tokyo and I was um, obsessively on Tumblr and looking at um, art and, and music and, and all this stuff. And this is when things like Vaporwave were really big on the internet. And you'd see Hiroshi Nagai imagery everywhere on blogs, um, just like all over the internet. Uh, and this was pre um, the YouTube algorithm going viral of Maria's plastic love. But yeah, to now fast forward into the future and I'm here and I'm, I'm seeing these works in a very, very different context to that. It's been pretty amazing. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm gonna, uh, I think we can ask maybe one or two more questions. So we've got another one that's come through from David. He asks, I am interested to know what the musical artists think about the popularity of the genre. The reissues are coming outside of Japan. Are there many reissues coming from labels within Japan? Maybe uh, Professor Owada, you can speak yes, to that. I, yes, definitely. Um, it is coming and um, I think Alpha is having this huge reissue project right now. And um, the, re the reissue project has been going on like every couple of years since the 90s, I would say. But um, 
even I was asked by a couple of uh, record producers back in Japan about, you know, a couple of years ago, what, what is the city pop revival in the West going on? <laughs> and how are they listening to it? And uh, yes, the, the re reissue is going on, but um, so yes, in a way, so from, from my perspective, the reissue, the light in the attic reissue was really the big news coming out, not from Japan, from the outside of Japan. And um, one of the things, this may sort of connect to our conversation previously, but um, so I remember those Hosono-san's um, reissues came out and I think Pitchfork um, reviewed all of them and Philharmony was the rank, the highest ranking album, which was really surprising because I think most maybe Japanese listeners would just say, you know, Hosono House is like the most popular album. But now, I mean, so this sort of says something about the, how the resurgence of city pop in general. I mean, everybody knows that Hosono and Hosono House is a great album, but like the album of Philharmony, which was, I think, came out in the early 80s, is really um, thought of as a really great album. Mm. It's, seems to be the, the new thing. Um, if you've been um, looking at the Japanese scene, especially. Yeah. I mean, the new, it's almost the resurgence is happening in now and you're overlaying now on right. top of, you know, history. And yeah. so you're finding the now, how does the now kind of coincide with, you know, what is happening artistically in other circles. And I think that Phil Harmony is maybe closest to, to the kind of experimentation that is, is e more easily possible now through the, you know, Ableton and various things. But Hosono was far ahead of the time in crafting an album that was pulling all of these influences. And it sounds, definitely sounds the most modern, I think. Um, I think the other albums are incredible but that one has such a modern sound to it. And so I think that you're kind of like having it hit in the now, it could sound like somebody produced it today. And I think those kind of, uh, you know, ratings, you know, you might 40 years from now, if it, they're reissued again, you know, and there's a revival of kind of like Americana kind of roots rock stuff and West Coast rock, maybe the decision would be different, but, um, it's interesting to see, you know, again, from outside eyes, you know, kind of like having it, and for Pacific Breeze, it was contextualized. I mean, Yosuke Kitazawa, who's phenomenal, who chimed in there, you know, is so, he knows that scene and that sound, and also really had the conversations for licensing with the artists and the labels. And sometimes it's surprising, oh, you want this? But when it comes to commerce, sometimes like, oh, you want this, huh? there might be value in it. So then labels, especially larger labels, want to kind of hold that value and keep control of it. But at the moment, the city pop and all the stuff, it was meant for a domestic audience. And I think it's time now for an international audience. And this has blossomed in such a way that has gone beyond the shores of Japan, which is really wonderful. And I think gives a lot of kind of credit to the musicians that it can be more universal sound. And so it's sometimes a bit of a shame when maybe a reissue is, is meant again for the domestic market, that it's nice to kind of have it become something that is thought of on a more international universal scale. And I love seeing what's happening, you know, on, on that level right now, not say that Japanese labels can't hit that international scale. It does happen. But I think that, you know, the idea of making this music accessible is really important. Yeah. Um, I want to just ask one more question um, before we wrap up. Uh, that is, yeah, I guess, um, just thinking about everything that we've been talking about in relation to City Pop being, it's, it's a revival, it's a resurgence, and talking about it in that context, but um, not only that, but also its contextualization with the, the bubble era um, in Japan at the time, and how City Pop um, is so intrinsically um, connected to 
that kind of social, that time of social upheaval um, and change, like of a of a era, um, particularly with the youth. Um, and I, I don't know if that's so much um, being repeated now with the resurgence necessarily um, on like a global scale, but do you think that there's some kind of equivalent to city pop music now in 2020, where there's like a music genre, whether it's Japanese or in general, um, that's really speaking to, uh, that really epitomizes the era of today in the way that's I don't know, but I mean, I think Mark is more um, familiar with this, but you know, the 80s has been going on for a couple of years now, right? <laughs> um, yep, but, still, still um, 1983. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I don't know if, if this is a right way to say, but I, I, I said like uh, The weekend Blinding Lights is obviously sort of a take on 80s retro uh, perspective, futuristic song. And it's so for me, it's sort of like, um, um, what was it, uh, Blood Orange? He was doing uh, 80s things too. And um, they were always uh, sort of like an 80s disc um, sounds going on for at least a couple of years. But I don't, I mean, that's one of the things I really want to know because. Um, after you sort of experienced like 10, 20 year recession in Japan, and all of a sudden this sound of like a bubble economy is um, having a revival in the world, is it, in a way really strange. Um, but when I was like doing some research on the city pop revival, I, I bumped into this, um, student newspaper at Stanford University, and it has a big um, thing called uh, the 80s, the sound of the Jap Japanese economic miracle. <laughs> so, so, okay, so, so City Pop, well, that might be a right way to explain it, but um, yes, there might, there must be something, I don't think people are being nostalgic about that, the bubble economy itself. Yeah. Yeah. They're listening to the music and they obviously have. Um, and yes, I'm, my hypothesis is just what Mark said. It's sort of like the, it's not the nostalgia, but the sort of this, um, the idea of fantasy and the reality that the balance of the fantasy and the reality is really crucial when you listen to those um, sounds, especially right now. And it, the, the way that those um, music was in a way um, based on the fantasy of the West Coast. So, you know, Los Angeles is a city of the images, right, the Hollywood and all that. And so um, it really, in a way, makes sense that you sort of leap a little bit above the ground and have this fantastic image which might appeal to the listeners right now but I don't know I mean that's one of the questions I really want to answer as well. I mean, it's, it's escapism is timeless you know yeah. but there's a time where it means more and I think that when you know where this this moment where you know months and months and months and months and months into you know the covid pandemic and people are in this started pre but i think that there's you know with you know we have both access to more good news than ever and bad news you know but often when you open up your telephone or your browser you're often bombarded with bad news and i think that music and the escapism and these kind of you know idyllic possibilities through sound are refreshing and i think that now we have hyper access to everything sonically all recorded music um and so you're seeing new age music really make a huge resurgence and you're seeing all this kind of music that is 
is built on imagination and escapism or uh, Alice Coltrane's music, you know, the 60s and 70s, really kind of universal expansive sound, these things of, you know, kind of impressionistic kind of, you know, classical composers then being reinterpreted through kind of new music for the home and all of these things that are kind of these sonic bones, you know, I think people are really into. And that doesn't have to be easy listening or mellow music. It can be very kind of, you know, dance music. But I think that people want to kind of travel. They want to escape. And music has always provided that kind of portal both into yourself and out of yourself. And I think that it's, uh, it's really hitting home right now because, one, people are at home right now. Um, but we have the ability to kind of, you know, access the whole wide world. And so um, it's when you see then again, like I saw a mirror image of Los Angeles and heard a mirror image of Los Angeles, but a shifted, a reverse image in this music. Um, and I think that people are, you know, fascinated with these worlds that are kind of built and created environments. You know, Los Angeles, Hollywood, that's not Los Angeles. You know, you can see a set and push over a two dimensional set and you have a grubby strip mall behind it. Um, but there's not, you know, you shouldn't take away from the power of the fantasy. It's okay to create a new environment. You know, that's what, that's what radio is for. It's what literature is for. It's filmmaking is for all these things. It's art, you know, is often to kind of transcend, you know, the, the boundaries. That's a really nice way to put it, Mark. I, I like that. Um, I think that's, yeah, the perfect way to, to end the Q&A unless um, you have anything else you want to add. I wish we could beam over and be at the exhibition right now and, and check it out. It's so wonderful what, what you've done. And uh, it's really, really incredible to, uh, to read the, the catalog. I hope that people uh, dig and dive into the catalog. And Professor Owada's uh, piece in there was so illuminating to me. You know, it's, it's really nice to be able to kind of, uh, you know, uh, move outside of my knowledge of this and have a different perspective and as well as uh, Hirofumi uh, Mizukawa really illuminating um, to, to read that essay as well so yeah thanks for this gift to the world and for allowing us to to be a part of it and we, we synchronized our shirts for the day too we had a meeting beforehand oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I should get the Hiroshi Nagai sky blue dreamer blue I was considering, yeah, getting like a, a gradient purple number. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Mark and thank Professor Owen, for the, taking the time to answer all of these questions um, and to, to speak with us. It's been yeah. a really amazing experience that, yeah, it's been such a joy, really, um, and an, a really nice extension of the exhibition. Um, which um, I wish you could see. Hopefully one day, it, maybe it will be brought to you. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> um, you download the catalog, you download the catalog and you put your face close enough to your computer screen. <laughs> do this, you're there. I already felt it. Thank you so much. Thank you so you're much. Welcome. You're welcome. We, um, yeah, if, if there's any um, other questions or comments from the viewers, um, please add them to the feedback form that I mentioned earlier. It's linked at the top of the comments thread. Uh, as our seasoned Japan Foundation Sydney event attendees will be able to attest, we really love our feedback from you. Um, so we're asking you to take a brief moment to fill out the questions uh, as it's, as yeah, your thoughts are very important to us and it allows us to keep making amazing programs like this one. Uh, so to, yeah, to close, I would like to sincerely thank our guest speakers once again, Professor Olada and Mark. It's been such a pleasure to meet you and to work with you on the catalog as well as this, this talk event. So uh, yeah, I really appreciate all of your enthusiasm and knowledge that you've brought. Um, and I hope that one day we'll be able to meet in real life, either here or Japan or the States, wherever that may be. Yeah, that would be, Definitely that would yeah. be the icing on the cake. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, it's been a truly wonderful experience. So 
don't forget to check out the full catalogue online. It's on our, our website on the exhibition homepage, Hiroshi Nagai Paintings and Music. And we look forward to hearing your comments in the feedback forms. Thanks. See you next time. Thank you.